We have uh, Dr. O'Hara here, she's a dermatologist. Uh, we have Dr. Abraham here, he's an ophthalmologist, uh, and myself, a cardiologist. So uh, without further ado, I'll start with my talk, which is about preventing heart disease and strokes. Uh, so, you know, after doing much training in cardiology and, you know, now working in the field now for the past few years as an attending cardiologist, um, the reality is that we study and uh, see primarily patients that have already succumbed to uh, this relentless, relentless disease uh, called uh, heart disease. Um, they get open heart surgeries, they have heart failure, they, they require stents, and that not only has a major impact on livelihood, the quality of life, but it's a disease that progresses uh, despite all the aggressive and, and new medical interventions that, that have come up. And there's been a lot of new technological advances. Uh, but it still does not impact uh, the, the, the progression of the disease. And we see the same lifestyle risk factors over and over again that are proven to lead to this horrific disease. And so that is why I'm so passionate uh, about prevention. So not only do I not get, it, uh, get to see it that often, you know, uh, as a cardiologist, I'm mostly in the critical care stage in the hospital, so I'm seeing the ramifications of end disease. Uh, but you know, I think it's a priceless opportunity uh, to not only delay but actually prevent the onset of this disease. Um, and so, um, you know, this is why I, I want to give this talk at this time as well. You know, we've had a lot of Assyrians that recently have succumbed that have acted in the Federation because of heart disease, and and so this also hits home for us here. Um, now, I do have to give out a disclaimer um, that everything that is recommended, you should always consult with your own physician, right. your own primary care provider. I don't know all the nuances of your own healthcare. And so I can't comment on that, and I'm sure this, uh, the other physicians as well share the same sentiment here. So for the point of the talk, um, you know, uh, I want to kind of go over how big the problem is, the root cause of cardiovascular disease, uh, the, the, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, explore the current evidence-based recommendations for reducing cardiovascular disease. I'm actually going to talk about the heart scans that have been advertised a lot recently and uh, how to pre practice prevention uh, with yourself, family, friends, and why we're here in the community. Uh, so let's start with some engagement. So how can one assess the risk of cardiovascular disease? You know, is it by checking your blood pressure? Is it by detecting the presence of diabetes? Checking cholesterol levels? A coronary calcium score? Or your age? What do you all think? All the above. No. Who, who said that? There you go, that is correct, all of the above. This is what happens when we assess one's risk for cardiovascular disease. It's not that complicated. You know, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is the leading cause for both men and women in the United States. So roughly one in three Americans uh, have one or more types of, of heart disease, which includes high blood pressure, having a coronary disease, which is called like having the plaque build up, heart attacks, heart failures, and stroke. So it's a big problem. And this is just a, a I, I want to show a schematic how it develops. You know, so it actually starts at a very young age, um, that it, it's quite undetected. And so it starts off with just streaks of fat along the vessels in, in, in your cardiovascular system. And over time, what happens is this fat actually injures the blood vessel wall. And so this injury of the blood vessel wall allows inflammatory cells and calcium to deposit, to deposit on the vessel wall. Uh, and then uh, most of these uh, plaques, this is what we start calling the term plaque, um, they have a, a cap around it, kind of like a protected layer over it. And so when this plaque cap ruptures or gets, uh, or gets cracked or tears, um, the really sticky substances that are hiding behind this plaque gets exposed to the blood, and you get immediate kind of coagulation, which is like a, uh, basically it becomes a clot in the vessel, and that's how most heart attacks and strokes occur. So this is a very long process, and so that's why the, the key way to address this is not with stents, it's with prevention, and with mitigating the risk factors that fuel this disease. And so, um, I'll break down these factors into the ones you can change and the ones you cannot change. And it's important to know the ones you cannot change because that makes you more aggressive as an earlier, at an early age to control these risk factors uh, that you can change. So what are the things that you can't change? Age, as we get older, you know, our, our vessels are more, uh, uh, more, more prone to develop this kind of process. 
And so, uh, you know, 85% of people that succumb to coronary heart disease, heart disease, are aged 65 and older. Males, males tend to have a greater risk of, of heart attack and stroke than women. And then on to my next point, menopause. So once females hit menopause, they start catching up to their uh, male counterparts uh, for cardiovascular disease. Family history, you know, there's definitely a lot of hereditary components of, of heart disease, a lot of, of which we understand and some we don't. But now we do a lot of genetic screening as well. Uh, but we know that the risk of cardiovascular disease increases if parents, brothers, sisters, children have the disease, and so you are most likely also to have it. Uh, race, the, uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease is higher in minority populations um, like ours. And the, the, the increased risk is partly due to higher rates of high blood pressure, uh, diabetes in, this, in these communities. So again, it's very important to know this, even though they can't change it, just so you know what, you're, uh, what you can uh, uh, get as you, as you, as you start uh, using some of the, or employing some of the other risk factors uh, that you can change. So let's talk about one of the biggest risk factors that you can't change, smoking. So tobacco contains over 4,000 different chemicals that directly damage the heart and blood vessels. Uh, so also, besides these chemicals is the nicotine. And nicotine also narrows the blood vessels. So it forces the heart to work harder, which in turn uh, increases your blood pressure. So get active. So in, uh, in inactivity is a major risk. So regular participation and monitor, you know, moderately uh, vigorous activity reduces the risk of fatal MI, so heart attacks that could kill you. Uh, physical activity helps control weight, reduces your chance of developing some of the other risk factors like hypertension, having bad cholesterol, uh, and diabetes, and also reduces stress, which is also a major form that could cause disease. Um, and you know, even those that, that develop disease, it can reduce their risk of subsequent, so further uh, uh, events of, uh, of heart disease. Diet is very important. So food is medicine, but it's also a cause of the disease. Uh, the only diets um, that we know that actually help the heart out and reduces blockages in the heart are plant-based Mediterranean diets. Uh, so I know our previous speaker, Asher Demer, was talking about a very high uh, red meat intake, which is great for his stage of you know, uh, bodybuilding, but in terms of heart health, that is disastrous. So uh, animal products like, like red meat and even chicken, so even poultry, uh, are increased inflammation. And so now we have another kind of aspect, aspect of what leads to heart disease is, is, is this major inflammatory cycle. And so animal-based products, so like meats, dairy, uh, it increases inflammation, which in turn accelerates the atherosclerosis uh, and, and, and bad cholesterol levels. So uh, we, as a community, are in the best position to deal with this risk. You know, uh, we have an amazing assortment of culinary dishes uh, that are completely vegan because we fast 50 days uh, just for Easter. Uh, so uh, when I was in Iraq um, uh, for Easter during Soma, it was uh, right before Easter, we were going to all the villages, and they had this huge assortment of all these amazing, uh, diverse uh, 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 vegan dishes. Uh, they, were, they were so like delicious. And so I think when we came into the West and all the abundance of meat, we've kind of kind of forgotten that aspect of our, of our, of our uh, culinary. And, and for your heart health, I think it's really important for us to revisit it. Not only because it also tastes good. Um, controlling weight is very important um, because overweight individuals have a higher risk of heart disease. Um, so even just a little bit of mod, uh, body weight loss, like 10% of your body weight, if you lose that, it's associated with like exponential reduction in hypertension, bad cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. So uh, as you see as I'm getting through this, it's repetitive. Because a lot of these risk factors, we already, all, we already know. So, so it's not complicated. But these are habits that are very hard to correct. And so that's why it's an epidemic. And blood pressure is very important. So, you, so the key blood pressure is less than 130 over 80. If you have heart events, if you had heart attacks or stroke, it's actually to get it below 120 over 70. So it's also important. I always recommend every family have a blood pressure machine at home. Um, so the most kind of classic things that we know of is bad cholesterol levels. So of course, that plays a really important um, uh, a risk factor here. And unfortunately, uh, uh, a lot of our profession does not do a very good job of controlling that. Um, uh, the reference ranges that are in a lot of the laboratories that when, when you get your blood uh, cholesterol levels checked are based on a very uh, kind of uh, average individual. And so based on your risk factors, the goals completely change. So do not rely on the reference ranges on the laboratories. Uh, it's, it has to be accustomed to your risk. 
and diabetes last but not least. So even if you have well-controlled diabetes, so your A1C is at a good level, you still have two or four times the risk of having heart disease than the, than the average uh, adult that does not have diabetes. So that's why I get this question all the time. Doc, my cholesterol level is good, my blood pressure is good, everything, all my risk factors. I don't smoke, I have a healthy weight. You know, why are you putting in a cholesterol medication? And it's because of that two to four time increase. So cholesterol medications are also given to reduce one risk of developing future heart disease. So I know they're called cholesterol medications, but you know, uh, they're, they're, they're given for much more than that. So now I want to talk a little bit about those advertised heart scans, all right? So I'm sure you've seen these billboards or magazine ads for heart scans. You know, they're plastered over the highways, they, they, they usually charge like four nine bucks, you come in, you get this heart scan. So is it really a gimmick? You know, is it something that we should do as a community? You know, because insurance com uh, companies uh, do not cover it. And I want to throw that all over to Dr. Elmer. Why are you guys not covering calcium scores? All right, I'm going to prove it to you right now. All right, so the test to detect coronary artery calcification, which is what I talked about earlier, so the beginnings of the plaque. Um, it's pretty simple. We use a non-contrast chest CT, so a CAT scan of the chest, so it does not have any contrast. It only takes about 10 minutes, and it zooms in on the vessels of the heart. And so what this does, it looks for the presence, location, and the extent of the plaques uh, in your heart. And this really adds to the reassessment of one's risk that I just talked about. So this is kind of putting a picture to the numbers, to the risk factors. So it allows us uh, uh, kind of an image of how one's heart is in terms of their, uh, their, their, uh, where they are at the, uh, uh, the development of atherosclerosis. So I always tell it like it's kind of a confirmation. So even if you don't have risk factors or you do have risk factors, this kind of gives you an added layer of providing to confirm if you do or do not have the presence of plaques. Much more important than some of the other risk factors that I discussed in terms of giving your the most up-to-date uh, kind of, uh, 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 kind of um, status of your heart. So here is an example of someone's a calcium score greater than 400. So this individual is interesting because they did not have any risk factors. So they didn't have any risk factors, traditional risk factors, um, and they would have gone by without being on a cholesterol pill. Maybe their blood pressure is like a little bit around like 130, so we wouldn't really be that tightly controlled. They're just a little bit overweight. And they went and get they went ahead and got a calcium score, and now they're put in a very high risk. So they're now treated as if they already had a heart attack. So um, so this is how important it can be in catching people that under, otherwise would not that would not uh, be considered high risk with their traditional scoring system. And also, I know uh, you know my, my colleagues here would also uh, discuss that a lot of the trials that they've done has been primarily done in white males. And so it doesn't really capture a lot of the minority population. So a lot of the studies, the research that guidelines that are based on uh, um, do not really capture, for example, South, South Asian populations, which have a, such, have, a, such, have a such higher aggressive form of atherosclerosis. So, um, so same thing with the serum community. So I think uh, this also plays in a role of how important it is for a community to be getting this done. So this is how we roughly stratify one's calcium score. Um, you know, the most important here I'm just going to go through is having a score of zero. So the score of zero is really important here because it tells us that you have no identical plaque, that, uh, that you have less than a 5% chance of developing heart disease, so very low. Um, and so um, compared to someone having over 400 where we treat them as if they have a heart attack. So this is where it comes into play. When some people have certain risk factors, maybe they're common, they're a little overweight, their cholesterol is not the greatest, but now you throw in this layer of a picture, and now we're able to easily stratify that into a high risk or a very low risk category. Um, and then, um, so the next question is, who should get scanned? So should you guys get scanned? So this is how I roughly do it to, to, to uh, so, I, I, so I'm not, so it's not very complicated. Um, there's large trials looking at, you know, when does uh, someone start getting a calcium score of non-zero, so greater than zero, so where there's some plaque already. Um, and based, it's all based on the risk factors, but really, if, if we base it just on your male and female, it's between the ages of 35 and 70 where this is between utility. So at, if you have any risk factors, even more than one, you should, uh, and that can include family history. So if your father had heart disease, 
then you should get scanned at 35 if you're a male. You know, uh, and if you have zero risk factors that are discussed, uh, both the ones that you can modify and you can't modify, then you can wait until you're 40 as a, as a male. As a female, you can do between 40 and 50 based on risk factors. Um, and if you have any more, more than one or two, then you should start at 40. And now, who should not get scanned is anyone that's already had heart disease, because you're already high risk. We're, we're already going to do full core press for you. So um, if you already have heart disease, you've already had a heart attack, or if you have a pacemaker device in which kind of messes up the quality of the image, or if you're pregnant because you can't get a CAT scanner, I mean, you should just wait until you deliver. It's not, it's not an emergent study. Um, uh, then that's the population that should not be scanned. So what does that leave us? That leaves us a lot of people that are not getting scanned. And it's because it's not covered by insurance, so it's not really, um, uh, it, it, it add, does add a certain cost to people, but luckily a lot of hospitals are providing this as a way to get people in the hospital, so as a marketing tool. <laughs> and so, yeah, because around them, it's, it's a couple hundred dollars. And so because it's a way to get people in, because there's so much disease in our society, uh, hospitals are uh, subsidizing the four and bucks, because they know they're gonna get you in to see their uh, services. Uh, so again, calcium score, it's the power of zero. So it's super important, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hammer this point one more time. So there was a large clinical study that showed that uh, someone that had no traditional risk factors, so people that, a cohort that had no risk factors I discussed, there's a lot of them, they got zero of them, but they had a coronary score greater than 400. They had higher events than people had more than three traditional risk factors, but had a calcium score of zero. So it, it's a game changer if you have a score of zero. And so, uh, and this is a population that we're always talking about, we don't want to give too many medications, people want to kind of be more natural. Uh, well, you know, if you have a score of zero, there's really good arguments out there uh, that you may not even be benefiting from statins or an aspirin. Um, so there you go. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to talk about the risk factors uh, in our community, uh, how important it is to be uh, checking up with a cardiologist. I, I personally specialize in preventative medicine, so this is my kind of forte, this is my passion, uh, but it's also very important uh, to reach out, uh, I think everyone over the age of 40 should be seeing a cardiologist once in their lifetime, uh, in, in, in to, because of this risk factor uh, that, that needs to be assessed. Um, so it's important for annual checkups, and if you fall into that kind of uh, category, definitely get a coronary calcium score. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer at the end of our talk, uh, and I provided my information here for those that would like to reach out. All right, thank you so much. So um, we're going to be doing the Q&A session uh, towards the end of this talk. Uh, next, I would like to have Dr. Elmer Ebo uh, speak. Sure. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the Federation for the invitation. It's great to be here with uh, Nathan and O'Hare as well, and Joe, obviously. Um, Dr. Michael's in the, in the room as well. Just want to recognize him as another doc in the room. Um, if there's any others, uh, my apologies. Um, so, um, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't know if you all have to introduce myself afterwards. That's nice. I'm glad they do. Um, oh, we've got a few more. we got a few more. Okay, stand up. Sit. Psychiatrist. What else? Who, who, who else do we have in the room? Tiffany. Oh, Great. I'll have to introduce myself to all of you afterwards. It's just great. So I'm an internist as well. Oh, we have one more in the back. Yeah. Neurologist in California. Urologist in California. Neurologist. 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 All right. Well, it's great that we have got so much talent in the Assyrian community. Um, and um, I'm certainly not going to come here as a clinical expert to, to all of you. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously, I could speak on some clinical topics, but um, frankly, as I, um, yeah, I kind of grew up in medicine. My parents were um, doctors. They both trained in Iraq, and um, my mom practiced for many years as an OB here in America. I kind of grew up surrounded by medicine, kind of knowing I was going to go into medicine as a, at, a, at a young age, and, um, um, you know, sort of being exposed to it so early really allowed me to sort of think more broadly and think more broadly about my role as a, you know, as a future doctor, like what would I do in the healthcare system? 
I knew I obviously wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to take care of patients, and I, I did that for many years. I, I'm not practicing anymore because I've transitioned to friendly you know, administration within the broader healthcare system. So let me ask this question. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, all of you have seen doctors at some point in your life. You, the doctors you've seen or the doctors you're seeing now, you, do you like? Yes or no? Not? No. Oh, interesting. There's, a, there's more no's than yeses. And, and, then, and then, do you like the healthcare system in America? No. And what drives you crazy about it? The socialism. <laughs> socialism. <laughs> What is it? What else? What, what other things about that American healthcare system drive you crazy? Too many pills for everything. Too many pills. The yeah. preventive cardiologist likes that as well. We need to be more healthy and engaged in healthy lives. Yeah. A lack of empathy. A lack of empathy. Yeah. I love that. You don't feel you're connected to your doctor. You're just a patient in the whole world. Yeah. Doctor, I would say it seems the path is not always very clear for somebody that's not familiar with the processes of form, the time it takes, who to talk to. It's, it's an incredibly complicated, fragmented system, and one that lacks empathy and doesn't engage in really great doctor-physician relationships. There's a huge lack of trust. Um, and I mean, my, my, when I went and visited my mom's clinic, she, you know, again, she was an OB, and she had all of these pictures of all of these babies that she had helped deliver. And, you know, I, when we were like going to the mall and stuff, the um, the the, uh, the the you could tell like patients would run into her and they would just love her um, and and so that's sort of my notion of, of what healthcare should be those are the kind of doctor patient relationships that people should have there should be empathy you know my doctor or my sorry my mom would you know make arrangements with the hospitals you know if the patient was uninsured for them to get like you know a delivery sort of off the insurance grid, off the system, you know, just paying out of pocket kind of at a Medicaid rate. You know, whether doctors would do that today, I don't know, but that's that's sort of the environment I kind of grew up in. And, um, you know, so, but I also saw the craziness of the healthcare system because I was observing it at a young age and stuff. And another comment from, um, I apologize, but the psychologist. Yeah, unfortunately, they look at the doctor like a production issue. <clears throat> So the, the system does push onto doctors this productivity mechanism. And so it was all of these questions about like how do you make the healthcare system better? That's what motivated me. And um, you, you know, while I definitely wanted to become a doctor, I knew I wanted to work on that sort of larger structural side of healthcare. And, and so then the question was, how do you do that? So, um, you know, eventually, you know, you have to start making decisions in your life, and, and I decided to go to law school in addition to medical school. I know that sounds a little crazy. Um, at the time, I was thinking, frankly, one day I might be a doctor working within the federal government at Medicare or something like that. And, and you know, it's a, healthcare is absolutely a heavily regulated industry. I don't think people even realize that half of the dollars that are spent in healthcare are being are coming through tax dollars, either at the federal government or the, or the state government through Medicare and Medicaid. So half of the money, even even in a private system, even half of the money that's flowing through the system is coming through um, the, the public side. So and I thought that, that at the time I thought that, that was probably going to grow. Um, it, it's, in some ways it has, and in some ways it's also grown on the private sector side. What we've seen over the course of the, you know, 20 or 30 years um, is, is just, frankly, huge, incredible growth in healthcare costs and just increasing complexity, increasing all of the badness that you guys have just described. It hasn't gotten better. It's kind of crazy. It, it, it kind of hasn't gotten, it, it, it's kind of crazy. So, you know, does that, so, so, you know, at the same time, this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of work I wanted to do. How do you get there? How do you put yourself, how do you position yourself in the healthcare system? And, and you know, I think, it, I mean, for all of us as, as individual physicians, we have to sort of find our role and find our niche, you know, and I'll let the others sort of speak to that. You know, Dr. Dinavi already sort of spoke how he has landed in cardiology and it allows him to do some of his interest in prevention and, 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 you know, this science is, is interesting. Is, and, and absolutely, I love the science, but, but I really like the sort of organizational stuff. So, you know, over time, I was in academic medicine for many years. 
But eventually I knew that like, okay, well the healthcare system is being driven by how people are paying for it. And so at the end of the day, who's paying for it? Well, I mean, yes, large companies and the government are paying for it, but they're paying it for it largely through an intermediary, and that's mostly these private insurance companies. So eventually I knew I had to sort of segue. And so now I'm working at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Illinois. It's part of a five-state Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. There's about 16 million members, which makes it about the fourth largest insurance company in the country. Um, there's about 22,000 employees for the company. There's about 400 doctors, um, but the 400 doctors, most of them are doing sort of things that Joe had sort of referenced when he said like, well, what, wait a minute, why isn't Blue Cross Blue Shield cover this you know, particular calcium score, this couple of device? I've done some of that. I do, on the margins, I have to I get involved in some of those questions, but that's actually not the majority of the work I, I do at Blue Cross Blue Shield. The irony is, is that, you know, like the, I mean, you guys all know healthcare is really expensive. It's it's consuming you know approximately 20% of the economy's dollar, a little bit less, 17, 18%. Um, it's definitely going to be 20% in a few more years. It'll probably go higher. It, I mean, that's kind of crazy. It's just it's kind of insane. But the the um, the issue is is you, you know millions of dollars are like flowing through my company every day to pay those claims, pay those doctors. And it, at the end of the day, the, those dollars are being paid for through contracts. And this is where sort of my legal training comes into play, which is just realizing like, well, at the end of the day, if you're going to start changing the way that healthcare operates, you frankly have to start to, way, to change the way healthcare is paid for. And, you, and so, you, you know, we, we've probably got something like 10,000 contracts across all of the doctors and the hospitals, keeping in mind that you've got a different contract for, let's say, commercial insurance, a different contract for Medicare, a different contract for Medicaid. It, 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 it's so complicated. You might ask, why is the complexity there? Oh, it, it's there. It, it, it's not going away. I, I mean, I could get into more historical reasons of why it's there. Um, does it generate work and income for people? Yeah. Other people's, other, the, the, the healthcare system, people complain about its costs, but those costs are generating jobs for people. And some people like those jobs. So it's, it's not easy to immediately come in and, and change it. You know, Joe did, Joe did make a reference, you know, around um, um, the calcium scores and that technology being used to drive business into hospitals. Um, and it, it, that's absolutely the case. Now, it, it might be that the technology is evolving, and that's another kind of thing. It's, it's really interesting. Um, when when a technology first gets established, it tends to be really expensive and maybe not as effective. And then over time, it's refined, the costs come down, and you start to realize, like, well, wait a minute, this actually is probably worth it. And is the health, I have, I'll be honest, I have to look at the data. The last time I looked at the data on the calcium score thing was a few years ago. I don't know if it was worth it. It probably is coming out of cost and it's starting to come, you know, more, you know, more in that, in that realm. Um, and you may, I might add that you also added the component of they have to have at least one risk factor, um, which is not necessarily what it's being marketed to. You know, I've seen people get those calcium scores for 30 year olds that are healthy and you're just like, what, what are you doing? Kind of necessary. But um, but the 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 issue is is you know, you know I, I think as, as Syrians you, you do like I, I the question is is how do you like here we are in America where you know you need to become you know something here in this country you got to establish yourself you know whether you want to be a, in a trade or at, you know as a professional. Um, and you obviously should you know, do a good job and, and, and um, you know, make a name for yourself. You know, for me, I wanted to certainly you know, make a name for myself within insurance and or within America, within the healthcare system, and, and try to contribute. Um, and that's not to say that it's easy or it's going to happen overnight or anything. You know, I, I'm starting to realize now as I've gone through it, like, Oh, you know what? The American healthcare system is going to be as complicated when I'm done as when I began, <clears throat> and that's okay. So that said, you 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 know you contribute as you can, and you 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 grow as an individual, you grow for yourself, and then you take that knowledge and that information you share with the people.
people that you care about, and and hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, you 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 know, you improve and um, you know, you make the world a better place. Is you, you know, in terms of what I do on a daily basis within Blue Cross, I mean, I'll just be honest. I'm just beginning, even though like like it's it's it's. I practiced for about 10 or 15 years. I think I got really good as a clinician, but then knew I needed to move on. Then I've been in insurance now for, I was four years at another insurance company, one of the Groves, and now I've four years, five years at Blue Cross. And now, only now, am I building enough sort of social capital within an, uh, an organization of 22,000 people that I can actually start to influence the organization. And so now I'm like, Guys, let me show you the data from my point of view. Like, so the irony is, is doctors, you know, doctors don't run insurance companies mostly. It's mostly finance people. So the people that are generating all those contracts and stuff, they don't know how to think like a doctor. Um, and and so the fact that the matter is, those tens of thousands or those thousands of contracts I mentioned are pretty flat. They're not that. They're not that nuanced. And so if you're going to um, alter the way that people are practicing, you want to shape the way those contracts are written and be much more nuanced to provide good health care as opposed to you know, average health care or health care that people are just generating health care for the sake of generating health care. Not saying all doctors are doing that, not saying at all, but it happens. Anyways, um, so that's kind of what I do. And you know, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, eager to talk with people afterwards or whatever like that um, um, for those who are interested. All I can say from a broader perspective is, yeah, as Assyrians, I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, we're all here in America and we need to take whatever, you know, take the benefits of why, you know, we or our families came here. And so I'm really proud that my family decided to come here and I've been able to, you know, gain the knowledge and, and, and skills I have and I'm, I'm happy to be contributing to the broader American public, but also happy to be giving back to the community and stuff. And so um, really appreciate the opportunity to have spoken a bit. Okay. So thank you, Elmer. Um, I will be talking about dermatology. I'll go through some of my cases and before and afters. Uh, we'll talk about skin cancer prevention, tips to optimize sun protection, and then a little bit about anti-aging skincare. So what does a derm do? Uh, we are doctors who specialize in conditions involving the skin, but also hair and nails. So in a typical day, I'll see about 25 to 30 patients, and I treat a lot of different skin conditions, eczema, acne. Um, I do a lot of skin cancer screenings. Uh, so I'll go through some of my patients. This is a young lady I treated with Accutane and cleared her acne. Um, I also do a lot with acne scarring, which can be pretty psychologically devastating to patients. Um, at the top are the befores and below are afters. Um, and this patient, we did about three sessions of a resurfacing laser and a little bit of filler. I got him nice smooth skin. Uh, there's needles and blood in this one, so if you get these, you don't look. But um, I do a lot of skin cancer screens, and with that comes removing moles and growths that are concerning, but also growths that patients just don't like. This is in the thick of the pandemic. <coughs> Still working. It's painless. He's numb, can't do anything. It's off and sent to the lab. So I do that all day long. Um, I do a fair amount of removal of stem damage. So this young lady came and uh, had a tough pressure she didn't like. I used an IPL laser and we cleared her skin really nicely in about two sessions. Uh, also, I a lot of hair loss. So this woman was shedding just tons of hair in the shower, also pretty stressful when you see that in the shower every day. Um, and I put her on uh, blood pressure medicine actually and some vitamins and we did PRP and restored her hair. 
And this is, this woman actually just saw it back last week and we had her on five months of treatment with Rogaine, shampoo, PRP, and some vitamins. And the vertex of her hair there looks really nicely grown in. We do a fair amount of fillers. I love doing lip fillers, under eyes. Um, it really gives people like a very youthful look. When you got these bags and I pull them, they just look more rejuvenated, not as tired, which is amazing. And then this woman is very young, uh, but she had bad lines. And this is just two weeks after doing some Botox, and she's has nice, clear skin. But it's not all cosmetics. Sometimes I get some pretty amazing rare cases. This patient uh, had gone to Peru. He went and did some ayahuasca in the Amazon for a week stayed in the rainforest, and when he came back, he had this growth on his scalp that was painful. And he came in and he said, you know what, I feel like something's moving in there. And um, he, <laughs> I had read about this in my textbooks, never seen it, but I'd always wanted to see it. So I knew he had a little plot fly parasite in there. Um, and I told my staff, look at this, this is going to be interesting. So we, again, if you get easy, maybe don't look, but um, we took that larva out of his scalp and better than anything was his reaction. He was such a good sport. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm my medical assistant is long Jerry. <laughs> So anyway, these are some of the things I do, and I love Durham because there's so much variety in the field. The procedures, I make people happy all day long, and I love that. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about preventative care. Um, I peppered my talk with some questions, so you raise your hand first and get the answer right. You'll get a sunscreen at the end of the talk. <laughs> okay, so true or false, people with all skin do not get skin cancer. Christina? That is correct. So all skin types can develop skin cancer, and that includes our people. Skin cancer is the most common cancer in the U.S., and one in five Americans will develop it in their lifetime. And about 20 Americans die from melanoma every day. So to increase your chances of spotting skin cancer early on, when it's most treatable, we have the following guidelines. And we call them the ABCDEs of melanoma. Um, and this is for lay people to know when they're looking at their skin, if they have a growth, should they go in to see the derm or not? Uh, so, so if you're looking at a growth and it's asymmetrical, meaning one side doesn't look like the other side, you should be seeing. B is for border. We like our moles to have a nice, smooth, round border. If the edges are irregular or scalloped, you need to go in. C is for color. Uh, we want our moles to have a nice, smooth, uniform brown color. Uh, if there's varying colors, reds, blacks, whites, that needs to be looked at. D is for diameter. Anything bigger than the eraser on the head of a pencil, which is around six millimeters, should be seen. And E is for evolving. So anything changing, bleeding, or growing needs to be seen. And something can fit all of these criteria and be benign, but it's just a way for people to know when to go in. We do recommend checking yourself for skin cancer, um, and that should be done typically about once a month. And this is I'll play this short video about what to look for or, and how to do it. So we talked about the ABCDEs. And skin cancer can happen anywhere, even where the sun doesn't shine. So bottoms of the feet, nails, between the toes, you have to look everywhere.
Another question. In the U.S., skin cancer most commonly occurs on which side of the body? The left. The left. That's correct. So um, that's the driving side. So left side of the face, left side of the body. There's more skin cancers in America, at least. Um, this is a pretty famous picture from the New England Journal of Medicine, which exemplifies that concept perfectly. So this man was a truck driver. He drove a delivery truck for 30 years. And the left side of his face is so incredibly sun damaged. And the right side, which was relatively more protected, has maintained a much more elasticity and has way less wrinkles. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So the, the effects of sun damage are cumulative. Doing something to protect your skin on a daily basis adds up to big benefits down the road in preventing wrinkling, freckling, and skin cancer. And we do this. We protect our skin by seeking shade wearing sun protective clothing, and putting sunscreen on all of the skin that's not covered in that clothing. Uh, I recommend a wide-brimmed hat. So baseball caps leave the sides of your face exposed. So wide-brimmed hat, no holes in the fabric. Wear long pants and long sleeve shirts with tightly woven fabrics. Um, believe it or not, white clothing does not really protect the skin the way dark clothing does. And um, we always recommend sunglasses for beauty protection, which I'm sure we will talk about. So as far as sunscreen, for day-to-day, -day, SPF 30 is fine. Um, if you're going to have extended sun exposure going on a hike or going to the beach, I recommend 50 or above. All right, another question. The amount of sunscreen needed to cover the body would fit into what item? A tablespoon, a shot glass, a teacup, or a teaspoon? A shot glass, that is correct. So a shot glass is about an ounce and a half, and most adults need one ounce to cover their whole body, and then about a nickel-sized dollop for the face. Um, and with sunscreen, we recommend broad spectrum, water-resistant, reapplying every two hours, and especially after sweating or swimming. And don't forget the top of your head and your hairline, the back of your ears, Lots of men get skin cancer on their ears because they just don't want to put sunscreen there. Um, wear gloves, cover your neck and chest while you're driving. Tons of my patients come in and they start to notice freckles on their hands and chest first. Um, and then the best sunscreen is one that you'll use. So there's no <laughs> right or wrong one. The smell that you like, the texture that you like. Um, these are facial sunscreens that I use. Um, the Elta MD is great. I use that when I'm hiking. The one next to it for vision is a tinted sunscreen. So I like that if there's an outdoor event or something, it adds a little coverage. And then this Color Science powder is amazing because if you have your makeup on but you need to reapply your sunscreen, you can actually brush your face with the powder and reapply your sunscreen without messing up your makeup. And then these are my favorite body sunscreens. You don't need sunscreen on a cloudy day. True or false? Yes, David. False. That is correct. So even when it's not warm or sunny, you need to protect your skin because the UV rays are present and reach us through the clouds. This is my girlfriend and I in Mexico City on a very cloudy day, but we're being very good about our hats. And then I'll just make a plug for skin exams. It's not really a part of our culture, I think, to go and get your skin checked regularly by dermatologists, but all of my Caucasian patients, it's ingrained in them from childhood by their parents. Go get your moles checked once a year. So I do recommend everybody see a board certified derm for at least one exam and let your dermatologist establish a baseline and a reasonable frequency for your exams. And then as far as anti-aging, uh, this is kind of the basics of a regimen that you should have for morning and for evening. And the goals with this kind of regimen is to one, protect your skin from the sun, but two, to stimulate collagen production in the skin through a, a multiple means. And the reason we do this is we lose about 1% of our collagen every year at around the age 30. And uh, for women that go into menopause, that accelerates rapidly. So to keep our skin looking youthful and plump, we want the collagen there, and you can achieve that 
um, with some of these top rules. So an exfoliating cleanser once a day, I like to do this in the morning, and the primary function of exfoliants is to slough off dead skin, and that makes the complexion look less dull and more vibrant. Next would be a vitamin C serum, and uh, these are um, topicals that help reduce wrinkles, stimulate collagen production, uh, even out the skin tone, and uh, lighten dark spots. And they act like an armor against pollutants and free radicals that we're exposed to every day, especially in big cities. These are some vitamin C serums that I like. Um, typically, the most active form of vitamin C is L-ascorbic acid. That can be a little bit irritating to people, so if your skin is more on the dry side or sensitive side, um, this one in the black bottle has THD. It's a derivative of vitamin C and not quite as irritating. And then for the evening, um, I like to do a retinoid. So retinoid is this umbrella term. Retinols, which are over-the-counter, and Retin-A, which is prescription, both fall under this category. And these are vitamin A derivatives. They're the only topicals proven to help prevent fine lines and wrinkles. And everybody should be on one, uh, unless you're pregnant. Um, and these, these topicals, these retinoids, are drying. So you use it just a pea-sized amount at nighttime. You start off doing it every other night to let your skin kind of get used to it. And then you can bump it up to nightly if you're not too dry. And then over top that to offset those dryness side effects, uh, you want to use a moisturizer with peptides. So peptides are sort of the latest thing in anti-aging skincare, and they serve as building blocks for both collagen and also elastin. So they help build tissue firmness and elasticity. And of course, there's all sorts of injectables, lasers, microneedling that will also help with collagen production. So for those get a consultation with your local juror. That's it. And this is my email if anyone has questions. Shana Shana. 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 My name is Dr. Nathan Abraham, and I'm an ophthalmologist, and my area of specialty is cataracts, and LASIK and cornea transplants. It's a privilege to be on a panel with such distinguished people, but I will tell you, I was put in a very difficult spot, going last after these incredible talks. And the only thing stopping you guys from the pool party is me. So I'm going to do my best here to make this as valuable as we can. I'm going to start off by talking about eyeballs and what I think is important and some of the things I hear. And then I'm going to finish my talk with my own story of how I got to where I am and why we do events like this. The eyes are a window into the soul. This is oftentimes a cliche statement, but in the medical world, this is very much true because whatever is happening in your body is also happening in your eyes. And like O'Hara said, you know, if you have a skin problem, you can look at it. If you have an eye problem, or if you have other systemic issues, you can look in the eye and say, okay, this patient has diabetes, so I'll control or not. This patient has high blood pressure, or this patient's at a higher risk of a stroke. All from eye exams. So seeing your health, your eye care providers at least once a year or more frequently is extremely important. So I can tell you, just based on the way that your retina looks, if you're a diabetic patient, how well you've controlled your diabetes, how long you've had your diabetes, and if your vision is going to be or is affected by your diabetes. The same goes for high blood pressure as well. Now, what are some of the common things that I hear from patients? Well, as you know, most of us spend a lot of time indoors, on computers, on screens, focusing. Now, what does that do to our eyes? It dries them out. So 75%, 75% of the complaints that I get from patients include things that are from dry eye. Doc, at the end of the day, my eyes feel so tired, they feel heavy, they feel itching, burning, it feels like there's sand in there, they're tearing, what's going on? And it has to do with the surface of the eye. To understand why people have these symptoms, you have to understand how tears are made and what tears are made of. Tears are made of two things, water and oil. 
the water is made by special glands up here called the lacrimal glands. And the oil, which is also extremely important, is made by very small oil glands that are all on the eyelids. So those are the two layers of tears, water and oil. Why is this important? Because the environment we live in is a very dry environment, especially in Arizona. It's hot outside, or if we're inside, there's air conditions blasting, there's fans blasting, we're focused, we're not blinking, our eyes are drying out this entire time. The second reason why this is important is because, remember those oil glands I told you about? A lot of times, people have what's called blepharitis. Basically, it's acne around the eyelash margins, so it clogs all those pores. So, what happens then? What happens is, the tears don't have any oil. Oil is the one lubricates and it insulates the tears, so they don't evaporate. So, understanding blepharitis and how to treat it is extremely important in treating dry eyes and helping relieve all these symptoms that people come and complain to me about. In the meantime, we can use preservative-free artificial tears as a band-aid to lubricate the eyes until we get patients to create the, a good amount and healthy quality of tear. Do not use Visine. Visine is trash. Visine, all it does is it constricts the blood vessels in the wet part of the eyes. It does not lubricate. It doesn't solve any problems. And it gets you addicted to it. Because the moment you stop, your eyes become even more red than they were before. So Visine has spent a lot of money on their marketing. That's why everyone uses it. But from what I see, and from the complaints I get from patients, Visine is not good. Preservative-free means they come in little vials. Vials don't have to be preserved. Use them a couple times a day and you can throw it away. Anything in a bottle has to be preserved. So my preference for people that have dry eye, the fundamental treatment is to use artificial tear. Now, what about that eyelid acne, blepharitis? How do we clean the eyelids to get the oil to start flowing? Well, we use eyelid scrubs, either in the form of Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo, or you can buy over-the-counter disposable one-time use eyelid scrubs. You actually physically scrub your eyelashes. And this will actually open up the pores. Which type people use, people prefer? I don't mind, as long as they're doing something like what O'Hara said. The best type of sunscreen is the one that actually gets used. So this solves half the problem of that acne. Now how do we get the oil that's been trapped in those glands to start flowing and lubricating the eyes like it's supposed to? We use warm compresses. So the way I like to recommend people do it is to take a washcloth, get it damp, put it in the microwave so it's a little bit steamy, about 20 seconds, and then place it on the eyes. This helps to break up all that clogged oil help it to start flowing on the surface of the eye. So I would say if people actually do those simple things, use artificial tears as they did, and clean their eyelids, most of them have dry eye symptoms in a couple of weeks. It doesn't require any prescriptions. I, mean, I have a bunch of tricks up my sleeve, drops, pills, in-office treatments, all that. But if people just stick to that, you'd be surprised at how much better they do. Now, how many people have kids here? Can you imagine what being a parent would be like nowadays if you didn't have things like iPads, and tablets, and cell phones? That would be tough. Everyone talks about epidemics. That's a word that we use and throw around a lot nowadays. But let me tell you something. There's an epidemic in my line of work that has been going on way longer, and it's going to get way worse than all the epi epidemics we recently talked about. And that is, effect of letting our kids use all these screens because it messes up the way the eyes develop. Our eyes develop where we focus on distant objects, near objects, intermediate, and take breaks. What do you think will happen to the developing eye if all day long kids are focused on a screen? They're going to develop nearsightedness or myopia and astigmatism. We won't get into what that is, but basically it's a worldwide epidemic where the behaviors that we're doing as parents and letting our kids use all these devices and focusing their world up close is creating a generation of people that will need glasses and contact lenses. As a LASIK surgeon, I'm happy to help them. <laughs> it sucks because we're, we're creating a problem 
that can be easily prevented by not just shoving a screen in front of our kids' eyes all day, all night. Instead, like when you were younger, you'd go outside, play, do sports, do things where you're not focusing up close all day, all night. Alright, those are some important things about eyeballs. One thing that O'Hara mentioned is UV protecting sunglasses. It's very important because ultraviolet radiation can damage almost every structure in the eye, the most important of which is the retina. That's in the back of the eye. It's also been linked to cataract formation. So wearing good quality UV protection in your sunglasses is extremely important. If you can get something that's polarized, even better. That cuts out more of the ultraviolet light. So, that was the eyeball part of my talk. Now let me tell you about some real life stuff, and my story, and how I got to where I am. I was in college, and I wanted to go to med school. So I thought, okay, I can take these classes, study, do well, take the MCAT, like that's, you can Google that stuff, there's no question about it. But, who can I find to a med school who's done this before? Okay, well, luckily, I'm related to a guy named Dr. Samir Jonah. He was calling, I was like, hey, I want to be a doctor, what should I do? And he's like, do this, don't do this, and I'll make some phone calls. So, fast forward, I got into med school, and went through med school, worked hard. Med school was very tough. And then, the first two years of med school are all book work, so you're just studying, taking exams, pretty straightforward. The third year of med school is when you get into your clinical rotations, and you rotate in different specialties, and figure out what you want to be when you grow up. So, day one of my ophthalmology rotation, as soon as I saw an eyeball magnifying, I'm like, that's it, where do I sign up? This is it, this is what I want to do. But I'm like, okay, uh, who do I know that has done this? Who do I know in the eye care field? And I don't think, well, I have a relative that's married to an optometrist. His name is Dr. Edmund Bekmal, he's sitting right there, okay? So I called him, I was like, hey doc, you know, um, I love what you guys do. He's an optometrist, a little bit different than ophthalmologist, but in the broader spectrum of eye care. And I asked him, I want to become an ophthalmologist when I grow up. Do you know any ophthalmologists? He's like, oh yeah, there's a guy named Dr. Chris Sumala. He's in LA, you should give him a call, I'll give you his number. So he gave me Chris's number and Chris immediately said, I'll help you get to where you want to go. Here's a research project, do this, don't do this, I'll make some phone calls. Fast forward some more, and now I'm in ophthalmology residency because of the letter of recommendation and phone calls that Chris Sumalan and Dr. Bakbali helped me with. And so the reason I bring this up is because I thought to myself, you know, after I ended up finishing my training, especially in med school when I was already you know, accepted into residency, I thought, gosh, there has got to be a better way to do this. Can you imagine? Well, I was thinking to myself how much harder it would be if I didn't know Dr. Edmund and he didn't connect me with Dr. Chris. So I thought, all right, I'm going to create a group called the Assyrian Health Science Facebook group where everybody that's Assyrian and in any form, way, shape in health science can join this group so that they don't have to go through the struggle I did, and I just happen to know so-and-so. So we created that in 2013. And to date, there are about 800 people in that group. All areas of healthcare, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, research, at every level of training. People that want to go to school for that, people that are in school for that, recent graduates and seasoned professionals. So the reason I bring all that up and tell you this long-winded story is because mentorship got me to where I am. And events like this are really important for developing our Assyrian professional network system so that we can help each other get to where we want to go because we're very spread out. It's very difficult to find you know, a very concise, streamlined area where you can say, hey, I want to be this work when I grow up, and I'm going to find people that have done it to guide me. So mentorship is extremely important. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. Um, again, it's been a pleasure being on this panel, and now we'll take some questions and answers. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Alex.
Elmer. Sure. Um, how do you see technology changing healthcare, especially after COVID with all the telemedicine and, and uh, technology that is developed and accepted and used? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I, so, so let me put technology in the broader context, you know, of what I was talking about earlier. Like, you know, when people talk about healthcare costs, and like, oh, we need to control healthcare costs. I mean, ultimately, when you're trying to control those costs, you're drilling in, you're drilling in on the technology, and you're asking the question, well, which technologies are providing real benefit for the to cost versus which technologies aren't. And like I was saying earlier with, with Joe, that that you know that balance of costs and benefits changes with time. You know, then you know just as the technology evolves. And we see that in other areas, you know, obviously. So the 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 changes that I see in the horizon coming because of new technologies are Mind blowing. Like, in all honesty, healthcare as you know it today is not going to exist in 30 years. It, it's it's going to completely be different. Maybe I'm maybe I'm a little bit more of a you know out there healthcare futurist, but personally, I think that 30 to 40 percent at the low end, and it could be higher, of the brick and mortar healthcare is going to go away in, in 20, 30 years. And that the vast majority of the healthcare will be done through mobile technology. And now that's not just all video calls. It also means, you know, you're plugging in, you're, you're going to be having, you know, data capture at home and collecting real healthcare data points, whether they're blood pressures or, you know, your cholesterol or your, you know, your blood sugars and things like this. And, you know, the kind of care that you used to have to go to the doctor for, you're, you're you're going to just do it through a, an app of sorts, you, you know. Now that said, the, the we're still we're we're still in the very very beginning phases of it. So I said it's like a, it's going to take at least I'd say twenty to thirty years for that to really play out. Just because the 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 technologies need to evolve, they they need to get better, and then they need to integrate into the traditional healthcare system. I mean, like right now. You've got a bunch of these apps that are floating out there. I asked Joe about it earlier about you know people getting their EKGs on that cardio mobile thing, right? Like that's the kind of technologies that's going to like happen, but it's going to happen across the board in every single in every single area. That's not to say that you're still not going to need to see doctors. You're absolutely going to need to see doctors because um, eventually you are going to get sick. But a lot of the healthcare can move into essentially the mobile and home environment. That, and, and hopefully, this is this is this is um, theoretical, yet to be proven. In theory, people's health will get better, and and lives will get longer. But eventually, they will start to get sick, and then they'll have problems, and they might need to come in and see clinics, you know, come in clinics and things like this. But I, I think a lot of the healthcare becomes mobile. I think a lot of the healthcare becomes mobile. We have even we have even started to see change. That's just my view. I'm, I'm so curious to know what some of the others think. I mean, you know, I, I yeah, yeah. Oh, like a lot of the, the, the uh, diagnostics that we do is uh, inconsistent between providers, inconsistent between specialties, inconsistent between hospital systems and regions. And AI is going to kind of smooth everything over and make things standardized, and it's going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, so, yeah, so machine learning, that's going to be the future of medicine. Right. So, with that, I mean, the the, the, the AI is going to really drive a lot of the diagnostics, and the thing is, is but you're still going to need physicians to do the technical aspects, and I think um, you, you know that's where I think medicine, and too, in terms of doctors, starts to evolve. Is you're probably going to see less and less, you know, pure primary care doctors and more and more specialists in the future. I think that's just going to be inevitable. I think it's just. Um, Joe, so I have a question for you. So back to the uh, You talked about like you know like like anti-inflammatory qualities of the food and stuff. What do you think about their in terms of like, shorting the period that people have inflammation from consumption? Sure, that's a great question. Actually, the the, the last uh, major 
a study that came out in the, in the Journal of American Cardiology was combining a pesco mediterranean diet, so really rich in uh, uh, vegetables, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, um, whole, uh, fish instead of uh, land-based uh, meats, um, in addition to intermittent fasting had the best effect in reduction of all-cause mortality, CV and specific cardiovascular risk mortality, and that includes even cancer. So yeah, so intermittent, intermittent fasting uh, is, is, is critical to this. It's just, we have good data from it. Um, for a while, it was kind of like a fad, and then they actually studied it and saw that it was, it was better. People in this cohort performed better than those that did not have intermittent fasting, and it had a lot to do with the insulin spikes. Um, and it could be done very easily. So people think intermittent fasting is very difficult, but if you just shorten your window of eating from like 11 a.m. to like 6 p.m., you know, you have all your kind of your meals in between like 11 to 6. You have your fasting in the morning and you have your fasting in the evening. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot doable, and that's what this study looked at. Making an intermittent fasting schedule that's actually, uh, we can, like most people can, can follow. And was that, and was that control for other risk factors? Uh, it, it basically, uh, yeah, so it, it was basically uh, the baseline characteristics were pretty much even across the board. So it included people in every category equally. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, it was actually, I did an Instagram post a couple years about it, but I'll, I'll send it to you. Question for Dr. Abraham. Uh, Doctor, I've always known some of my pick up along the way that polarization on sunglasses is important and it's helpful the point where when I, we go with friends to the beach and they don't have sunglasses and they want to buy cheap ones that don't have polarization, I tell them, no, 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 I have this piece of information that you should get polarized sunglasses. How wrong, right, off, or on the point is that information and what am I missing? Yes, yes, okay. yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, let me put it to you this way. I don't buy sunglasses unless they're polarized. Okay. okay. The danger of buying cheap lenses that don't filter out for UVA UVB and other you know, UV spectrums is that it tricks your pupils into thinking it's dark outside. What do our pupils do when it's dark outside? They dilate. So now you're dilating your pupils and you're not filtering out UV radiation, which is worse. I'd rather have people not wear glasses than wear cheap ones. So yes, polarization is great, but equally important is getting good. Usually the more pricey the sunglasses, the higher chance that they have good quality UV, AP, and polarization lenses. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for your beautiful talk, and I'd like you to see that you also encourage other Syrians. I have a question to Ohana. You mentioned and you talked about vitamin C. Is there any advantage or disadvantage if I take it orally or as a shot as, in, as an injection? That's a great question. Um, oral vitamin C um, is not as bioavailable as putting it on topically, so you're not going to get the effects directly to your skin when you take it orally as when you put it directly on the skin. And what about injections? Vitamin C injections? I will have to get back to you on that. I'm okay. Not sure. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. We're, we ran late into the second uh, lecture. Uh, we're all available. We're going to be at convention during this weekend. We're, we definitely will entertain any questions. Uh, we also have our contact information, so please feel free. We're very approachable. Okay, thank you.